Today's reading is from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am, I am the good shepherd. And now I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather around your word now, may the words of, of my mouth speak the thoughts of your heart. And may you speak to our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we think about this fifth I am saying, I want to take you to the night of Passover, where Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. For um, over the three years that they've been with him, Jesus is uh, followers have, have, have shared many, many meals with, uh, uh, with uh, Jesus, but, but none of them have been quite, quite like this one. The atmosphere is heavy. Jesus is clearly troubled. The evening begins with him washing their feet and leaving them with a command that whatever happens, they are to love one another. And then as the meal progresses, he tells them that he must suffer, that one of them will betray him and that Peter will deny him. And then it dawns on them that, in fact, this is a farewell supper. Jesus is saying goodbye. Life as they've known it in the last three years will now never be the same again. Jesus is leaving them. And everything from now on will change. I remember when um, Rosie and I knew that the time had come for us to leave our home in Paraguay and return to the UK. We had been there for 15 years. We had lived in the same house for 14 of those uh, 15 years, and it was the only house and the only life our children knew aged 15, 11, and four at the time we broke the news to them. And I remember the day we, we sat down and we said, we're leaving Paraguay and we're going to live in England. And, and the heaviness of that moment, the sadness, the, the sorrow and, and, and the bewilderment, everything is changing. And from now on, nothing will be the same. And then Peter voices the question that everyone is longing to ask, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says to all of them, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to my father's house. It's a, a spacious place with many rooms. I'm going to, to get things ready for you and then I'll come back for you and we'll go there together. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas replies, no, Lord, we, 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 we don't know the way. So how can we know the way? And you can sense the kind of anguish in Thomas's voice. And it's then that Jesus says, I am the way. You know the way to where I'm going, Thomas, because I am the way and you know me. I am the way, the truth and the life. And then he adds, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I know that this, this added sentence, no one comes to the Father except through me, is um, uh, something that many have struggled with. The fact that Jesus doesn't say, I am a way to God, 
but there are plenty of other good ones. Rather, he says, I am the way, and then he makes it clear, I am the only way. But I'm going to park that one for now, but I promise you I'll come back to it. Um, maybe next year. No, um, a, bit, a, bit, a bit later on. Um, but for now, as we think about what Jesus meant by the way, the truth, and the life, we're just going to spend a few moments on each word in turn. But I just want to quickly remind us that the statement, I am, is such a, a loaded Jewish phrase because it immediately takes us back to Exodus 3 and the burning bush when God identifies himself to Moses as I am. So each time Jesus says, I am, he's saying he's not just man, but he's God. And that's really important. God, the bread of life. I am God, the light of the world. I am God, the gate and the shepherd and so on. So I am the way. We can think of the way as being a space between two objects or two places. So the way to Morrison's is out of here, turn left, cross the road, through the front door there. The way is the space between here and Morrison's. The Greek word for way is hodos, which means road or route. And in the book of Acts, it's interesting that the early church started by calling themselves followers of the way. The way from where to where? What did they have in mind? Maybe the way from man to God or the way from earth to heaven or the way from life on earth through death to eternal life. But when Jesus says these words in that upper room, What's the way he's referring to then? I guess the way from where the disciples are now to eternal life. Jesus is saying, I am the road between these two points. The one that can bring you and my father together. I am the space between you and God. A theological illustration we could use is a bridge. A bridge makes possible a road between two points that couldn't otherwise exist because of the chasm or the obstruction that must be, be crossed. In this case, the chasm is the reality of our sin, yours and mine, that separates us from God's holiness. And the whole message of the gospel is that Jesus is the one who can cross that chasm. He can be that bridge. When I was on my cycle trip around Europe, almost two years ago, I left on Easter Day two years ago, I stayed for a couple of nights in Turin with Ivo and Carla, and they looked after me so well for the two days. And when the time came for me to jump on my bike again and carry on my journey, Ivo wanted to explain to me how to get from their house across Turin to the road that would take me west to France. But he didn't speak English and I didn't speak Italian. So in the end, he said, look, I drive you and you, and you follow on your, on, your, on your bicicleta. So he drove off through the streets of Turin and I followed him on my bike and he had his hazard warning lights on. And of course, because he was only going bike pace, all the cars were building up behind and these Italian drivers were getting so, you know, beeping their horns and overtaking. And Turin, have you seen the film, The Italian Job? Filmed in Turin, it's every bit like that now, but even worse. Um, so for the next 40 minutes, I just had to follow him. And, and, and eventually we made it to the other side of the uh, city. And Ivo stopped his car and he said, this is your road. Just follow this road and you'll be in France by the end of the day. Ivo was my way. I just had to follow him. He was my bridge across the chasm of Turin to my place of, of peace. And Jesus is our way. We just follow him. He won't speed up. He doesn't want to lose us. He says, I will take you to where I am going. He will lead us across the chasm of human sin, along the road to the forgiveness and goodness and love of the Father. And I think the most important thing I want to say to us all this morning is that no matter who you are, what you've done, how lost you may feel, 
Jesus says to you, I am the one who can lead you to that place of peace with God, the deepest longing of yours in every human heart. Trust me, believe in me and follow me. So from truth, sorry, from way, let's now go to truth. The truth, it can mean three things, can't it? There's factual truth. So the truth that London is the capital of England. It's not Paris. It's London. That's correct. And then there's moral truth. So when I knowingly tell you that I spent the afternoon in the office when I was really in the pub, then that would be a lie. And you could say that I am not a truthful person or I'm not being truthful in that moment. And then there's truth in the sense of something being genuine and not a copy or a fake. So the true painting of the Mona Lisa hangs in the Louvre in uh, Paris. All others are either copies or if they're pretending to be the real thing, then they're fake. So when John, at the start of his gospel, describes Jesus as the true light that has come into the world, he uses the word alethinos, which means the original light, the first, the original one, against which all others are pale reflections or copies. And everything about Jesus was truth. He brought the truth of God into the world, proclaiming it and embodying it. And he spoke about truth many, many times. Truly, I say to you, I am the true vine. I am the true bread. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And isn't that so true? Isn't it just so freeing when you've been living a lie and suddenly you can be honest and speak the truth? It may be painful, may be hard to do, it may be costly to do, but the relief to be free because the truth has set you free, that's the power of truth. It's interesting, isn't it, the link between the word truth and trust. They have the, the same linguistic root that comes from a word that means something firm, something solid, and something steadfast. So when truth is absent, Trust is immediately undermined. And this matters because the world cannot function properly without truth. Personal relationships can't function properly without truth. Governments can't govern properly without truth. It's now generally accepted that our online world is putting truth under pressure like never before. Some are calling this an era of post-truth. Experts call it truth decay, with the increasing influence of opinion and feeling over fact and declining trust in the sources of factual information. And we're even getting to the point where people don't seem to mind if their leaders tell them lies. I heard a, a fascinating exchange between a supporter of Donald Trump and a journalist. The journalist asked, Aren't you concerned that Trump doesn't tell the truth, that he lies whenever it's convenient for him? And the supporter replied, no, that's just Trump. That's just how he is. We know he's lying. He knows he's lying. So it's okay. Now, Biden, he's far more dangerous because you don't know if he's lying or not. <laughs> But Jesus says and still says, I am the truth. I speak truth. I speak the truth about God, and I speak the truth about humanity's relationship with God. And the truth he speaks to our hearts, to each one of us, is who we really are in God's sight, about our brokenness, yes, about the consequences of our sin, but also of God's deep, deep love for us, the value he places on us, and that in Christ Jesus, He gave his own life for us. Last week, Katie spoke about the lies we hear from the voices around us that we all too easily believe. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what people say about me. And to these, Jesus says, no, you are precious in God's sight. You are honored. And you are loved. 
There's a song by the band Casting Crowns that I think expresses this love for us so well. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin, who would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. That's the truth that Jesus speaks to each one of us. So the way, the truth, and now the life. Life is extraordinary. We can't quite put our finger on where it comes from or where it goes when it's gone. But we know it's there. Living things move and breathe and procreate. There's activity and there's creativity. And just as Jesus embodies truth, he also embodies life. Just in John's gospel, we read, in him was life. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus says, the water I give wells up to eternal life. And when Jesus says, I am the life, he means that he is the way to eternal life, life through death, to life with God. And for the believer, eternal life is both a present reality and a future hope. It's Jesus' presence with us now amidst all the joys and sorrows and the struggles of our life on this earth. But it's also the hope beyond the grave that because Jesus is life, it's not the end, rather the beginning of a new chapter where we find ourselves more alive than ever in the eternal presence of God. Now, before we bring things to a close, I promised you that I would come back to it, so I will. What does Jesus say when he means, no one comes to the Father except through me? Well, I struggle, as many of us here do, over eternal destiny and what will happen to those who don't know Christ. And about a year ago, actually it was on the 5th of February, I preached a sermon entitled A Fresh Look at Eternal Destinies, which actually I found really helpful preparing because it enabled me to clarify in my mind what I think about these troubling questions. So if you want to find it online, do, or just ping me an email and I can send you a transcript of that. But for now, I think I'm just going to close with the words of Bruce Milne from his commentary on John. And I hope you find them helpful. Bruce says this, the exclusivism of this statement must not be reduced. Peter actually makes the same claim in Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. At a time when religious pluralism is widespread, such claims are never going to be popular. Nothing less, however, is the implication of Jesus' incarnation. If in Jesus God has come among us in person, to reconcile his rebellious lost world, it follows necessarily that through him and him alone is the way to God. This exclusiveness of Christ's salvation is simply the uniqueness of his divine person. So if the events of Easter Day are real and the death on the cross and the resurrection happened, then there can be no other like Jesus. He goes on, to talk about how we can view other religions in this light. To say that Jesus is the only way to God does not imply that every idea in non-Christian religion is devoid of value. Non-Christians may fulfill this or that element of the law of God engraved upon their hearts. And non-Christians as religious seekers may at one point or another express a response which reflects a valid truth. Such factors, however, do not overturn the general biblical verdict that the non-Christian needs Christ's atonement and forgiveness. 
or that non-Christian religion cannot offer salvation. Jesus alone is the way to God, but he is the way for all. So whatever the religious background of an individual or lack of religion, Jesus in his grace welcomes every one of them to the Father if they will come through him. For them too, he is ready to prepare a place in the Father's house. So I don't know if you find that helpful. I think I, I kind of always come to three legs of a table if you see the uh, tables in front of many of you. The three legs, the, the first is that God loves fully. The person I love most on this earth, God loves that person 10 times more than I do. God knows completely. We only know a part of people's story, people's experiences, people's journey. God knows that fully. And the third leg is that God judges justly. He is the one who is far more just than I could ever be. And I rest on those things. I'd love to go on and talk about how as individuals, we're to be signposts to the way, the truth, and the life that Alpha is an amazing invitation to colleagues and friends and families to, to find out more about the way and also how we need to keep our signposts clean so that people can find the way more easily. But I'm going to stop now and I'm just going to invite us to be still and just believe that God is present now through his Holy Spirit and uh, allow him to speak to our hearts. And if there is anyone here who is seeking faith, who is seeking the way at this time, maybe now you want to choose to follow the way, the way of Jesus, the way of his love, grace, and forgiveness. So let me just lead, lead you in a quiet prayer. Whoever you are, God knows your heart. Lord Jesus, in this moment, I turn to you the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know for sure that you're there, but I'm just going to ask you if you would come into my heart. And would you let me know that you are here. Forgive me my sin when I have wronged you and wronged others and turned away from you. And give me a new heart, strength for the journey. And give me faith to live a life with you at the centre. Amen.